Let's talk about ways we can identify outliers in the data. There are many different approaches to outlier detection. In terms of the level of supervision or human input, they can be categorized as supervised methods based on data classification or categorization, unsupervised methods or those based on data clustering, and semi-supervised methods which combine the two. You can also think of different mechanisms and basic ideas to find outliers. Statistical methods include those based on very specific assumptions and data distribution models that generate the data, from which the likelihood of normal versus outlier data can be inferred. Proximity-based methods rely on measures of distance or density to detect whether certain data points are too remote from the majority or in locations with abnormal data density. Clustering-based methods identify groups of data and based on those groups or clusters, we may be able to detect outliers either because they are too remote from the major clusters or because the cluster they belong to and form are too small or sparse. As we discussed, outliers come from a different process or model that generates normal data. These are generative models or stochastic random processes hidden behind the data. The idea here is that if we can find out the model that produces normal data, we will then be able to estimate the likelihood or probability of a potential outlier. Now, how can we learn from data about the models? These are two general approaches. The parametric methods, in which we assume data are generated by a distribution model with parameters, and the non-parametric methods, in which we do not assume a model but try to determine it from data. Though non-parametric methods are not necessarily parameter-free, they tend to be flexible and general when it comes to the actual functional form of the data distribution. Parametric methods are more specific and less flexible in that. A parametric method assumes a specific model of probability density distribution, such as the normal distribution. Different distribution functions may require different parameters to be estimated based on the sample data. A normal distribution, for example, requires two parameters, the mean and the deviation or variance. After the parameters are estimated, it is then possible to compute the probability of an individual data value. A value with a very low probability is a potential outlier. So let's look at an example. Here are some temperature data in Celsius. If we assume this follows a normal distribution, there are two parameters that we need to estimate based on the sample. The mean, which can be computed by the average, and the variance, which can be computed by the square sum of error. So we do that here and get the mean and deviation. So now we can plug the numbers back into the model, the normal distribution model, using the mean, which is mu, and the standard deviation, the STD here. And we now can estimate the likelihood of particular temperature values. So for example, how likely is the temperature below zero Celsius based on this distribution. So given the observed temperature data, it is extremely unlikely, based on the estimate here, that we are going to observe a temperature below zero. Now, how likely is the temperature above 30? 
we can do the same computation using the model here and it turns out it's about 18 percent so it's not very common but it does happen so we see we can estimate the parameters and build a distribution model uh, based on sample data and use that to estimate the likelihood and be able to detect outliers a related test for this type of outlier detection is the GROPS test which is based on the student's t distribution similar to normal the test computes a ratio between the z-score and a value from the t-distribution which measures the degree of departure from a normal range and how unlikely a data point is according to the distribution. So far we have assumed there to be only one data distribution. In various applications, the data may come from a mixture of multiple groups and the result of multiple distributions. In this case, it is a mixture of distributions where we need to estimate them individually and then combine them together in the final evaluation of outliers. Another category of outlier detection methods are based on data proximity. There are distances from one another and data density of their neighborhoods. The assumption here is that outlier data deviate significantly from other data either because they are far away from others or their neighborhood density is very different from others. With a density-based method, you can identify a density threshold R and compute the number of data points within that distance as a fraction to the total number of data points. If a data point has a very small fraction of other data points nearby, it is a potential candidate for outliers. In a similar way, one can also set a parameter k and measure the distance to the k's nearest neighbor. The farther the distance, the more remotely located the data point is and more likely an outlier. The idea of finding outliers with the distance method can be likened to identifying people in a remote, isolated area. The density-based detection methods are similar in that we'll continue to use the distance function. But instead of looking at the distance of one data point from others, here we are more interested in the distances within the local neighborhood because the outliers are local outliers. The figure here shows an example of data on a two-dimensional space. C1 is a normal cluster with a majority of data points. O3 and O4 are far away from C1 and can be easily identified as outliers. However, O1 and O2 are still close to the C1 cluster and difficult to tell based on pure distances. But if we compare the neighborhood density of O1 and O2 to the density within C1, we'll realize that O1 and O2 are in a much more spread and sparser neighborhood. If C1 can be likened to an urban population like in New York or Philadelphia, O1 and O2 are the central parks or Fairmont parks in the proximity of the concentrated population but are less populated. They can only be identified by its relative density, not its location. Because the parks here are actually in the city, in the urban area. So lo location-wise, you cannot find them. But density can give us the clue. To compare the density, we can compute two basic measures. One's distance to the k's nearest neighbor, dk, 
and the number of neighbors within the distance n k. And based on these two, a number of metrics such as reachability distance, local reachability, and local outlier factor can be calculated to identify local density outliers. Another angle to look at outliers is what group they belong to. And we may be able to identify them by performing clustering or partitioning of data points. An outlier in this case either does not belong to a cluster or its distance to the closest cluster is greater than usual or it does belong to a cluster but the cluster is rather small or sparse. And we can follow these ideas to detect them as individual outliers or groups of outliers. To do this, we first perform clustering on the data and then evaluate the three situations, whether a data point is too far away to belong to a major cluster, or whether the data point is associated with the cluster but its association with other members is weak and far, or whether there are abnormal clusters that are too small or sparse to be considered normal. The clustering-based methods are unsupervised and do not require the existence of labels in the data. For classification-based methods, you do need existing labels to train and supervise the process. The outlier detection problem can be treated as a one-class or two-class classification problem with the normal versus outlier classes. Once data have been labeled as normal or outlier, we can then train and test using virtually any classification models. Be cautious though, that outlier detection is a special classification problem. For one, the data are overwhelmingly normal data. So it is a very biased data set with a very small fraction of data in the outlier class. In addition, while it can be straightforward to characterize what is normal in the data, there are abnormal data or outliers due to a wide range of issues and situations. Unless these situations have appeared in the training data and have been properly labeled, it will be difficult to build a comprehensive outlier detection based on classification. With the unsupervised clustering methods and supervised classification models, one can combine them in situations where there is insufficient label data to train classification. Clustering can be done to automatically identify normal versus abnormal groups before they are used in the classification methods. I would like to stress the point that certain outliers cannot be identified individually in a global context. In other words, these outliers may look normal when you look at them alongside with all data. Some of these outliers can only be found when you contextualize the conditions. You will need to identify related variables and groups to construct the context first and then analyze the behavior variables to see if they behave in a normal range within these groups. For example, let's look at the age distribution of working adults in the U.S. according to the 1994 census data. Here all data are used to plot the distribution so we are looking at the global picture. 
based on this distribution, you can tell that it is not completely abnormal to have working adults at the age of 20 or younger, even though they are not as common. So it does happen that some working uh, adults are quite young. Now, if we limit the data to the group of people having masters or doctorate, we are looking at a very different distribution. And we can tell that the distribution now is centered around an older age. If we assume this to be a normal distribution, it then becomes very unlikely for a working class adult with a graduate degree to be 20 or younger. These are potential outliers. They are in fact contextual outliers and the context here is defined by a graduate degree. 